So in another life, I was a folk singer, and I'm just going to, I need this tool right now, so I'm going to take it. Um, I didn't really read the directions at all, and so I thought we were supposed to tell our life story, and then I felt really lame when everybody was doing all these important topics, but... Today is the 52nd anniversary of the loving Supreme Court decision. <laughs> and I didn't really put the pieces together on that, but to be able to tell my story of being multiracial in America uh, means a lot today. And so this is great for me, and I hope it's great for all of you. Thank you so much. I am ready for my first slide. <laughs> So my name is Keisha Rahm, and this is a talk about the complexity of the American story, the experience of being a Hindu in America, and being the daughter of immigrants. And that's me in the Bristol Fourth of July parade. Okay, so what is a Hindu? This is my parents' Hindu wedding, and they had a Jewish one as well. A wedding between a Hindu and a Jew has become much more commonplace with the rise of Silicon Valley. In the Jewish faith, you are Jewish if your mother's Jewish. By Hindu tradition, you're Hindu if your father's Hindu. So I'm a Hindu. My father was a small child when his family fled the part of India that became Pakistan and then came to the United States to attend UCLA, where he met my mother. My mother's family are the great Jewish bowling people of the Chicago suburbs. My mother spent her teenage years in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, and then went to UCLA on a scholarship where she met my father. Between my mother's MBA and my father dropping out of the engineering program to pursue his love of cooking, my Jewish American mother and Indian father opened an Irish pub in Santa Monica called McGinty's. <laughs> this was the Guinness list my father lovingly assembled. The black velvet Guinness and champagne is still what I drink every St. Patrick's Day. My high school in Santa Monica had almost 5,000 kids, and my graduating class was about 1,200 students. It was a diverse school. Where the black kids sat was called Africa, where the Latinx students ate was the border, and where the white and Asian kids sat was called Disneyland. My racial ambiguity was one of my greatest assets in high school because it gave me a passport to all the groups and the cliques on campus. This set up a lifetime of being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And that was important because I went from spending my life primarily at the beach in between my academic and activist pursuits, of course, this is Leo Carrillo, in case you didn't know that, to new adventures with seasons, trees, and trying new things in Vermont. This was my first and only deer hunting trip in Victory, the smallest town in the state with a population of 62 people, and the night before I slept at Michelle Fay's house, who's in the audience, who's presenting next. <laughs> um, my mother was actually the reason I moved to Vermont. She had gotten a scholarship to UCLA, but she dreamed of going to school on Lake Champlain since she was a girl. I never knew that until I was accepted and decided to attend UVM. And that's when she told me. One of the other major reasons I moved here from Los Angeles is that I heard an NPR piece about a dog chapel in St. Johnsbury, <laughs> where people who love dogs could go. And this sounded like my kind of state with my kinds of religions. I experienced cultural plunges like my first game of stump, where people drink between throwing a hammer in the air and nailing in a nail on a tree stump, and I can't remember the rules beyond that because I was too busy watching out for flying hammers. And then I was asked to introduce a man to speak at UVM in 2006 who had a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas. With a father from India and a mother from Illinois, I had never heard a story like mine in mainstream politics, let alone from a sitting US senator. We both ran for office the same year. He became the 44th president of the United States, and I became the youngest state legislator in the country. I may stand out in politics in Vermont, but I stand on the shoulders of other pioneers, like Governor Madeleine Kunin, herself an immigrant from Sweden, who fled the persecution of the Jewish people and then went back to become the ambassador of Sweden and get reparations for the Jewish people. And I like to think that I can pay it forward so that the next generation in Vermont can see themselves staying and finding opportunity. That is my nephew Hamza, and that's his mother Fardoza in the background, and she was told she was not UVM material, and we fought that, and there she is. I hope I take after my grandmother, my Dottie G. She was so insistent on excellence, and 
Even if she wasn't around to see the product of her insistence and hard work, she did it anyway. She moved from India the day before I was born to help raise me, so I was devastated when she passed away just as I was starting my legislative career. When she passed away, we visited her last home in Punjab after they fled the part of the region that became Pakistan, where she planted mango trees that the children still say have the best mangoes in the whole area. And I think that says a lot about the immigrant experience, rooting yourself somewhere and doing your best to make it a little better than you found it, even if you never get to see the fruits of your labor. In this time of great pain and terror for immigrant families, I share my example of what America can and should look like. After all, if you can see it, you can believe it, and if you can believe it, you can be it. Thank you. All I want is some